the stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw. I would be Bradshaw. That would be the WWE Hall of Famer, Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. Last week, we were number three in the world in wrestling podcasts. And that streak will probably come to an end and will probably be canceled because we just jumped the shark. We've got Tony Chimmel on our show, and this is going to be a disaster. I'm telling you right now. Chimmel, welcome to our last show. Uh, thank you, and typical Bradshaw bragging about being in third place. Well, I'm here, and I only accept first place. Hey, don't even get me started about you being in third or second place. You lost the Battle of the Fats for the Pride of America on July 4th to an Englishman in the reenactment of the Revolutionary War and embarrassed America. So don't even talk to me about being third. Well, what I did was I did what America does and help others. That's what I did. I put lines me over not that you as a wrestler ever put anybody over but that's what i did that day you know chemo welcome to the show number one you know and i and it, let, let me let me just digress just just a little bit see this beautiful jersey that i have on this is an authentic native american jim thorpe america's greatest all-time athlete who happens to be from Oklahoma and was kidnapped by the white man, probably some of your great, 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 great grandparents and shipped off to Pennsylvania that, uh, at Indian school that they had up there to take the Indian out of him. And so he, he made the football team because the coach saw him running one time and then he got drafted. Then he won, went on and won, you know, what, four or five of those Olympic gold, gold medals? medals with the no, big, no, 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 no big deal. And plus, he was a great baseball player, great football player. And so um, he we got drafted by the Canton Bulldogs, the number one team, the first team in, in professional NFL football. And I saw my co host, Mr. Layfield, that, that Texan who just, this just goes to show you that occasionally, but it was, it was from a lost wager. I keep putting him over too much. And it only took him two years to pay off because this is hand woven. This is hand woven. It's just not one of those. You go to a sporty goods store and said, I want that. You got a special order of these things. And Mr. Layfield was a man of his word. Finally, after two years of unmerciful ribbing for me, paid off. And this is the result from the, my Tampa Bay Lightning winning their second Stanley Cup over that, that day. Hey, hey, uh, Chimble, did you know they played hockey in Texas? I didn't think, I know they don't play college football in Texas, that's for yeah. sure. Well, we, we <laughs> saw that when they went up a little bit north and, you know, and played Kansas. I mean, who the hell? Oh, good, he's frozen. Uh, but but thank you thank you John uh, y'all cherish this for the rest of my life which probably won't be long after this show here but Jim will... <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming minute, I thought I thought Jim Thorpe it was from Pennsylvania because there is a Jim Thorpe Pennsylvania you know of course there is you guys kidnapped that's when they were going around kidnapping all the all the Native Americans and send them to white schools to de-identify them you know. Indian out, out of the out of the man, you know, but it backfired him on with me, you know. But uh, Jim Thorpe, uh, he made Pennsylvania famous, so of course they're going to adopt it. Yeah, he did. Ben Franklin didn't, I guess. Uh, uh, who Ben? Who? <laughs> who? <laughs> you know the guy that invented the kite, Ben Franklin. Oh yeah, that's the reason you were always out outside flying yeah. a kite when you were a kid. But anyway, you're not from Pennsylvania. You're from damn New Jersey. God's country north, baby. So but just Frisco, tell, what? tell us a little bit about you growing up in New Jersey. Right? Well, you had a pretty famous neighbor, a neighbor by the name of Gorilla, right? And uh, yeah, that's how you, yeah. that's, uh, unfortunately, that's how you ended up in our business. I guess he's to blame for the whole, the whole deal with me in WWE. But yeah, when we were growing up, I lived in a little town called Willingboro, New Jersey, in South Jersey, God's country north. And uh, one day we just saw a moving truck. I guess somebody was moving in a, a few houses down or whatever. And we were in the, and just playing around, playing street hockey or something. We couldn't have been but six or seven years old. And up comes this kid. He says his name is Joey. And uh, 
he just joined in and started playing around and we all played sports together and got along and we found out his dad was Gorilla Monsoon and, you know, he was a professional wrestler and all that. And we just built a bond and a friendship and uh, lasted until the day he died. But it was great, you know. I'm still uh, friends with his family and all that. And uh, they're great people. They were still you, were, nor were you more normal as a kid than you are as an adult? <laughs> <laughs> I think I've gotten better, like wine, <laughs> over age, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> but Briscoe, I got to thank you. That's when I lived in God's Country North. Now I live in God's Country South, Fort Myers. And Gerald Briscoe is the reason for this. Because probably about 30 or 35 years ago, me and my wife were looking for a place to go on vacation. And I asked Gerald, who you know, lived in Florida, hey, where can we go? to uh in florida for vacation and you said sanibel island so we never heard of the place never been there so we went there she fell in love with the place the seashelling just the whole area and all that and we we've gone there like every year for like 30 years brought the kids or mom uh everybody and uh finally she was like hey when the kids get out of the house how about we move there and i'm like i'm okay with that you know no state income tax nothing like that love Florida. So we picked up and moved here and now we're in our, you know, last house or condo and just love it down here. It's so great. Now, so great. now you, Gerald Briscoe and Carol Baskin all live in the same area. And by the way, that's the lady who allegedly murdered her husband on Tiger King because I know you don't watch television. Yeah. Thanks uh, for telling him that, John. Uh, Carol, I do watch television. Uh, and Tiger, you, Tiger King was the guy who had all the big cats. He looks like Ma Michael Hayes' son on meth. <laughs> I did watch the Tiger King. I did watch that. But, yeah, that was kind of goofy. Hey, hey Tony, 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 just because I, I grew up in Oklahoma, probably, and, uh, and, 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 and Joe, uh, Joe Exotic's uh, uh, kingdom is just right few miles from where I grew up and now I'm, I moved to Tampa and Carol Bassam wanted to move in close to me and she started her her time big cat tiger rescue right down the road for less than three miles from my house and so now I'm forever labeled I made the mistake of telling Layfield you know you can't uh, it's that old deal tell 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 a mailman tell a wrestler tell Layfield you know and now <laughs> Now every time we come on, he's got to say I'm 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 next door neighbor with Carol Bastion and grew up with Joe Exotic, you know. But it's one of his old Rizats, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> God. <laughs> I'm, hey, I'm, a, I'm a married man, John. Come on. You are now. <laughs> Jim. Yeah, no. Your, your your wife. Your wife. Well, the first times I met her. It was on your birthday. About oh, God. Yeah, you remember. Oh, God. So, Jerry, we're going to strip Chimble buck naked, and we're going to throw him out in the crowd because it's his birthday. So as we're sitting there, we, you know, he's- Oh, what a birthday his... present. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah. So we look up, and there's this woman there, and I said, oh, no, I can't believe we're doing it right in front of this woman. I said, Mel, I'm sorry. We're just having fun. She goes, I'm his wife. And I said, I, 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 Mel, I'm sorry. She goes, Oh, continue. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> she gave us her blessing. She's still yeah. with you, Jimmel. Absolutely. Can you blame her? Been married 32 years. Hey, John, he just bought property in Florida. He ain't, she ain't leaving him now. <laughs> yeah. We love it here. Walk right out back. There's a pond. We go fishing. Everything. It's beautiful. Hey. We got deep sea fishing. Not in that pond, you don't. Well, I'll tell you what, I caught a tarpon in that pond. I don't know how some of these, some of these saltwater fish get into uh, these ponds and stuff in Florida. But <laughs> Brother, you're like I Bobby caught, Jaggers. You're like Bobby Jaggers. What, what are you talking about? You caught a tarpon in a pond? Uh, a saltwater yes. fish in a retention pond, John. Yes. That, that makes yes. a lot of sense, right? I did. I swear to God, I got oh, the picture. Come on, Jaggers. 
I caught, I'm telling you, they get into these ponds either through the pipes or the tubes or, you uh, know, I, I, I tell you that one of one of these uh, birds, you know, you got the big birds down there. They they go fish and they catch these little tarp and then they fly over so they can wash them off in the fresh water and they'll probably escape there and they <laughs> grew into a big monster, a tucot. I'm telling you, there's tarpon in there. I caught a tilapia in there. There's also I a caught tilapia. like Wow, I listen. Did. You sound you like an damn Floridian and I got a tilapia. Did you even know what a tilapia was? What? Yeah, so it's it it some sort of fish. I don't know. I, 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 I just hope you don't go and lay in the sunshine because somebody might confuse you for a well and try to harpoon your ass down on the beach. God. <laughs> Brutal. <laughs> so what are you fishing for? Or, or a manatee. You could be a manatee. I mean, you know, you, you resemble a manatee. What I what are you so fishing there's bass in there? I've caught bass in there. I've caught catfish in there. Uh, we caught these cichlids in there, the tarpon, all there sorts was an of old wrestler. I can't think of his name, lived up near Toronto. And when he'd hear his story and he thought it was bullshit, he would do this. He would go like <laughs> that. This is for you, Jimmel. This is sign language for this story is not true. I'm telling you, it is. I've well, got it. John, I got to back him up on that. Occasionally, they do find uh, some water that, uh, uh, fish in, 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 the, in the fresh water because it, some of the, and, and Chimel, by the way, you know, there, there is a thing called the Gulf of Mexico. You don't have to go fishing in one of those little trailer parks. No, I know that. Lines. We do the saltwater yeah. fishing, too. We do the saltwater fishing. I caught my son caught a shark when he was down here. Uh, we've also gone on the boats. We love it down here. That's what I'm saying. So the pond is just if we want to, you know, throw the poles out there for a little bit. But we also got to start getting into the, the, you know, offshore fishing. We got some saltwater poles and stuff like that. So we enjoy that too. Hell, hell, anybody ever get get on a boat with you? It'd be like getting on the boat with Gilligan. Gilly, you go out for a little <laughs> three-hour cruise and probably end up uh, on a deserted island out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. You know, well, somehow I fall. You know, Mickey Henson is a great fisherman down in the Key West. I love Mickey. He, he come, he's come and visit us. We go down there to Key West and see him, too. My wife almost caught. She didn't get it in the boat, but she had one of these Goliath groupers on the line. Oh, man. Oh. Got it right near the boat, and then it snapped the line and got away. Well, those damn Goliath groupers are bigger than a damn boat, usually. Huge. I know. Especially Mickey's boat, but it was nice. <laughs> so he got a little <laughs> rowboat. Right? I've been out of Mickey's boat. I had a great time with Mickey. That yeah. in the boat. That in the boat that our friend JP Shellnut now they drowned you and ran over you. It is. It's the same <laughs> boat. He ran over me. JP Shellnut ran over me in Mickey's boat. He did. He almost killed me. You know Shellnut, don't you, uh, Timo? You remember no, that but guy, is the boat it. okay? I just want to make sure <laughs> after uh, he ran over Bradshaw, is the boat okay? The prop exploded. Oh, shocking. <laughs> you know, guys, words hurt. That's not nice. Words hurt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Tony, when, 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 you know, you, 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 you were friends with Joey Morella and, uh, you know, and how did, how did you guys hook up with that other guy uh, from, from up in there, that damn, uh, uh, Mike Kyoto? How, how did he? Uh, my boy, Kyoto. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, we were all friends together. I think Joey, Joey knew Kyoto a little bit more than I did at the beginning. So, uh, when, uh, Gorilla, I guess, owned part of the business. It was Gorilla right. and um, Arnie, Bill Zatko, Arnie, and uh, and Vince's dad. And when Vince's dad uh, died, Vince took over, and I think he bought out the other three or whatever. And the story I heard was that I guess Gorilla and Arnie got uh, got lifetime contracts with the company. But we used to set up, me and Joe, we used to set up the ring for Gorilla and go to these little shows in, you know, Baltimore or Washington or Scranton or something like that and set up the ring. And when Vince bought off Gorilla, that was the end of doing the ring. But then a couple of weeks later, Vince said, hey, does your son want to uh, want to set the ring up for me and work for me? And Joey said, yeah, and he could pick someone to help him out. And Joey picked me. And that's how I got my foot in the door. Thank God for all of that. And then um, a few years later, uh, Joey just moved up to becoming a referee. 
and uh, Kyoto started helping with the ring and doing that. So that's how he got in. And then me and Kyoto were traveling around for, I don't know, 20 years on the road uh, doing the well, ring. How old were you? How old were you, were you when you started? 22. 22. So. I think so. Yeah, like 22. I mean, we were probably setting rings up when we were still in high school or, or like just a year or so after high school, maybe 19 or something. Uh, but actually with the company, WWE, I started like when I was 22. And when did you first realize that it was Gorilla uh, that was living next to you? Uh, I guess we found, because, you know, you'd see him like walking around the neighborhood or outside his house and stuff like that. And, uh, and you know, we'd ask Joey and say like, man, you know, and Joey would say, my dad's a professional wrestler. Joey was pretty proud of it, which I don't blame him, you know, and he would say my dad's, a, and we watched wrestling back then. I mean, you know, we were just young kids, but I remember watching you, Bradshaw, when I was a little kid. <laughs> and, uh, I, hate you. I, I cannot believe we asked you on the show. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, granted, you used to get beat all the time, but, you know, <laughs> he still watched. Hey, Jerry, but, uh, Jerry, you got to hear it. When I had my run in 04, so I, I got, we're overseas and Chimble's the ring announcer, okay? So I realized just as a joke one day, I get up and I sing God Bless America, just as a joke. You know, we're, we're laughing about the chic, you know, say, don't, don't chat USA, don't chat USA. So I get up and sing God Bless America and the place goes ballistic. <coughs> it got real heat over it. Place is blowing like crazy. So then I took it a step further. I said, tomorrow I'm gonna sing God Bless America and get the American flag out. So we're somewhere overseas. So I have Chimmel wave the American flag. Well, I know what the fans are going to do because they want to boo me. So they want to boo me. So they're throwing stuff at the flag and Chimmel's in his tuxedo and he gets <laughs> beseeched with drinks, spit, you name it. So every night I'd get up there and I'd say, God bless America. And I'd have Chimmel go around the ring carrying the flag, waving the flag up for me. <laughs> He would yeah, get that, that was great. Then he would, and then when they throw stuff at me, Jerry, I would stand right by Chimel and I'd hook his arm where he couldn't leave me. So uh, I know I'm gonna get hit with everything. I would make yeah. sure Chimel got hit with everything in his nice tuxedo. Uh, you know, John, John, when Chimel was first starting too, I mean, uh, we we stored the the ring truck there at Briscoe Brothers Body Shop, and they they used to when they'd start the Florida tours, they used to have to come over the body shop and and and. Uh, and uh, pick up the truck and some, you know, we, we didn't have inside parking, but we had a nice fence in yard. So, you know, it'd get dusty or rain or something. And, and, uh, and uh, the truck wouldn't look great. And, and Vince was one of these guys that, you know, if you drove around anything that had a WWF at the time logo on it, that thing had to be spit polished all the time. It had to be so, so Tim would get out there and he had to have to wash a truck down. And some of our customers, and of course in Florida, he'd take a shirt off. Some of the customers would come by and actually take their uh, car out of our shop because Tim was over washing the truck <laughs> with a, without a top on. That guy doesn't really, I mean, we had to explain to him, he doesn't really work for us, you know? <laughs> Brother. <laughs> Brother. Tim, how was Gorilla uh, when you met him uh, growing up? Oh, he was great. He was great. He was always the best. And, you know, I remember they had their, uh, he was always good to all of us, you know, and, uh, the gorilla would, uh, he would always had a, uh, room. They changed their garage and made it his little office and he had a, a pool table in there and we would always go in there and play pool and stuff like that. He was very good at pool. Joey thought he was good too, but he wasn't good as gorilla. But I remember Gorilla said, you know, to Joey, I'll beat you with a broomstick. So he, Gorilla used the broomstick to uh, play pool, and he beat Joey, you know? Really? <laughs> yeah. So uh, another one, another thing, too, is they had a basketball court right on their driveway. We used to go over there and shoot hoops all the time, and Gorilla would be out there shooting hoops, you know? And Joey would always be like, oh, I'm going to make one from the end of the driveway. I'm going to make one from the end of the driveway. And Gorilla's like, you're not making that. You know, he's like, if you make a shot from the end of the driveway, I'll buy you a moped. Now, for the younger people, a moped is like a bike that's also a little scooter or a motorcycle. So you can either pedal it or you can ride it. So anyway, 
months later go by and next thing i know i see joey driving around on a moped i'm like oh you must have made the shot huh he's like yeah i made it <laughs> so gorilla bought him a moped <laughs> but he was yeah uh, yeah i love girl i thought he was awesome he, and he knew he was like a, he was a huge gambler right and a good gambler. yeah right? yeah yeah he liked to gamble a little bit and uh a little yeah, bit. Was... A little bit. <laughs> the man had a suite at Caesars in Vegas. <laughs> yeah, him and Mrs. Morella used to go down. Him and Mrs. Morella used to go down to Atlantic City a lot and stay overnight and all that. And we might have had a party or two at their house while they were gone. <laughs> <laughs> but that was always a, uh, fun times there. You know, Morella was the best. Chimel, is it true that Arnie Scullin is still getting paid for White Plains, even though he died about 10 years ago? <laughs> probably. <laughs> oh, probably White Plains. I can't believe they still run that place. Jeez, Were you oh, in man. the garden when uh, we got Arnie so uh, fired up, he wanted to beat up Lou Albano? <laughs> no. Oh, it was awesome. I tried to stay away from the garden. What a mess of Schmidt that place was. <laughs> Jeez. You didn't like the garden? No, no. Well, we're here? a fine house show. Doing it once is fine. fine. Going there anymore, forget it. Parking sucked. It all sucked. Well, you you like it because you guys probably got big checks. I got paid the same whether I did, you know, goofball West Virginia or New York City. It didn't matter to me. I'd rather well, first do that. First, first of all, and, and by the way, Joe, all of us are about. First of all, why has it got to be goofball West Virginia? Yeah, why all of our be? fans in West Virginia now. Hate yeah, me. all of them. Yeah. Now, now you just got to kicked off the air in West Virginia. Hold on, they have internet in West Virginia. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't all know. Right. That. <laughs> Can I? I told you this was a mistake, West Jerry. Jerry I, I told say, you this is a mistake. Yeah. Instead of say. goofball West Virginia, can I say shithole Texas? Is that okay? No. <laughs> Now oh, you'll get now you're going somewhere with this. Story. No, he's not going somewhere with it. What's wrong with you? Texas. Oh my God. I yeah, isn't that, that, right. isn't that a wonderful state? Uh oh Tony, my God. I mean, you know, the people give, down there. I'll give Texas two things. One, Whataburger. Loves me some Whataburger. Yeah. The other thing is I'll give you the river walk in San Antonio. Other than that, forget it. And I hate that stupid flag you guys freaking fly all over the place. The freaking goofball one-star flag. Hate it. What's wrong with our flag? You're in America, at least kind of. But I mean, it's America. <laughs> Fly the American flag. I don't care what your state flag is. Flag. It's state pride, Jimmel. Oh God! Oh well, uh, John. Growing up in Jersey, you know, as St. Pride, is, <laughs> except that, that they're not taught New Jersey State history. <laughs> Larry Heck taught me. He told me that when his daughter was going to elementary school in uh, in Texas, they would sing the the Pledge of Elite, not the Pledge of Allegiance, but the Pledge of Texas. Is there such a thing like that that the kids do in school? Of course there oh, is. Yeah. God bless <laughs> Texas. Oh, whatever. Hey, how about the time you and Hornswoggle were tried to get a bunch of uh, trucks to blow their horn while Larry Heck was changing the tire on the side of the road? <laughs> yeah, Cord Corderas was there too. Loves me some Corderas. <laughs> don't don't so act we, like you're Larry Heck's friend, okay? Stop it. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Larry loves me. <laughs> yeah, so after, after, after he hears your remark about West Virginia, he'll really love you. So, uh, boy, what so Jim, you drove the ring truck. You know how to fix tires. You know how to do stuff like that. You have a flat tire on the side of the road with Larry Heck, and you don't offer to help at all. All you do is stand out there with horn swaggle and get horns blown by trucks driving by. Well, listen. Yes, I did drive the ring truck for many years, but when I became a superstar and the greatest <laughs> ring announcer of all time, that was well beneath me. I didn't do that. I had people to do that, you know? So we get into cars. It's me, Corderas, Larry, and Hornswoggle. We get in the rental car in St. Louis, and we start driving. I don't know where we were going, but we're driving. The show's not in St. Louis. So we're driving and we're only about maybe 10 miles from the airport and the tire goes. And I'm like, well, Cordero's always drove. 
I would sit in the passenger seat and Larry and uh, the midget are in the back. Are you allowed to say midget or is that? <laughs> no. no, no, you're not. No. Okay, no. Now we're now we lost all of our little people here, John. Yes, That's our little people. Sure <laughs> now, wait a minute. In fairness, Hornswoggle prefers to be called midget rather than dwarf. So technically, in Hornswoggle's eyes, you're correct. But everybody else on the planet, you're wrong, Jimmel, as normal. God, what can I not say these days? Whatever. So well, anyway, you know. uh, yeah, thanks. So anyway. <laughs> I'm like, let's just turn around and drive it back, you know, and get another rental car. Cord Cordaris and Larry are like, what are you talking about? There's a spare in the back. Let's just change it. We'll get to the, the next, uh, when we get into town, we'll find the next Hertz or Avis or whatever national dealer, and we'll, we'll change the rental car. So I'm like, okay, you guys want to change it, change it. So they're on the side of the interstate there changing the tire while me and me and uh, Hornswoggle are standing on the side. So all the cars and the trucks are going by. So while they're changing the tire, we're all giving them the trucks this stuff so they'd be blowing their horns <laughs> as they're changing the tire right there. And they're like, will you guys stop? We're trying to, I'm like, hey, we could have just drove back, but you know. You know, I've got a video of Hornswoggle taking you down in Gorilla. You know the video. Nah. <laughs> well, and I'm a, if, he's I'm a, I'm a, down, if he's taking me down, how far did I really have to go to begin with? You know? I mean, what did I fall? A couple inches? <laughs> Am I offending anybody? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. You put a sign up that was too short for tall for a hornswoggle to read as in the production office so you you were mean to him i would have loved it. tell us he about that that, 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 that that sign was great I, I, I don't know i know i'm pretty sure you didn't come up with that but who come up with that you know it's like a disneyland sign you got to be this this tall to go, go. <laughs> <laughs> jim well that's mean yeah whatever he, there was one time when we were at the same hotel and he comes, I knew he was coming to my room. So he knocks on the door. Right. So I open the door and I'm looking and I'm like, who the hell's knocking on the door? And I slam the door in his face. <laughs> he's got so hot about that, but he's a good kid. I love him, man. He was the best is the best, whatever. Did, he never did anything to you when he was at ringside, did he, when he was under the ring? Oh, he always did shit. He would, you know, when the mic would be there, he'd always, like, pull the mic cord. So I, I'm sitting there, I have the mic by the bell, and next thing I know, I see the freaking microphone, like, slowly going towards the underneath the ring. And I'm like, jeez, if this match is over soon, which, believe me, I always hoped the match was over soon, uh, I'm like, <laughs> I need the microphone to announce the winner. <laughs> And he would start pulling on it. Then I have to put my foot on it. And he would do all that gaga. But what, it was great when they, uh, overseas, when they put the chicken underneath what, the ring. Was you in the ring then, uh, Chemo, when this happened, when, when they threw the rooster under the ring? Yes, was there? I was in the ring, and then I was sitting right by the ring when it happened. We, we actually uh, ha had Hornswoggle on this show, and John threw his... Uh, uh, private investigation service and his, his expert contacts was able to get the footage that was shot by who was it Scott or some one of our security guys and we showed it yeah. at the same time uh, Hornswoggle was telling this story it's hilarious I wish I had been on that tour what, what was your what was your take of it what was your oh, description it was great I, I didn't even know but apparently he's really afraid of chickens or something yes. you know yeah so he would have to get under, you know, he would, whatever segment he'd be on, you know, it might've been, if it was on the first, the first match or something with fit, he would have to get under the ring, like before doors open. So he would go under there and he'd be hanging out under there. Who knows what the hell he was doing, playing video games, messing around on his phone, falling asleep, whatever. But, uh, they, uh, they, they found a chicken, I guess, Davey Coates. God love him too. He'd do anything. Yeah. <laughs> he, he found the chicken, and uh, right before the match, they threw the chicken underneath the ring. And Scott or some security guard was there, like just with the curtain peeked open, and was able to videotape it. And I guess that's what you got. And uh, uh -huh. he was running, running scared underneath there. Did you hear him <laughs> screaming? 
Huh? Did you oh, yeah. He was screaming and whining. It's like, ah! He's trying to pick up stuff. He had like a, a, a hammer or a wrench from the toolbox under there. And who knows what else? A kendo stick or a chair or whatever was under there. He's trying. And this chicken is just like walking around and, you know, doing a chick, whatever a chicken does. I don't know. I never lived out in the freaking sticks where you have near chicken. So, you know, whatever wait, it is. Wait, they, wait a minute. I grew up on a farm and we had chickens. There's nothing wrong with that. And John from the country that's famous for chickens, Texas. So what? what? I, well, yeah, there are chickens. We're not, we're not famous I for chickens. Uh, Chimmel will back me up, right? Texas yeah, well, no. I, I, heard, I, I heard that Texas is famous for being chickens. Not yeah, for well, having. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, same thing. Same thing. thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's because of all of your great colleges in New Jersey. Uh, yeah, it's called the Ivy League, Princeton. What did you go to? North Mexico State. Oh, great! Now I offended everyone in Texas too. No, I went to and, and Mexico. And Mexico. We have a lot of a lot, a lot of viewers in, in Mexico, and you just offended the entire yeah. country of Mexico. <laughs> I went to the Harvard of West Texas, Abilene Christian. Christian. Went to a Christian Texas. school and didn't get hit with a bolt of lightning. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> so, Jim, who made the mistake of making you a ring announcer? You know, I think that was Bruce. <laughs> was oh, it really? I think so, because because uh, I was overseas and ring announcing there. And I think it was the first time Bruce, I, I don't know if they did a pay-per-view there, but, it was, you know, back in those days, it wasn't like a big TV type of thing, but it was something on TV, something like that. And Bruce really liked my announcing and thought I did a good job, which, you know. He Bruce had to be sick. He's the smartest oh, man in the business. Anyway, next thing I know, that, you know, a couple months later, they asked me if I wanted to start announcing on TV and stuff like that. So, you know, that was just the beginning of me becoming famous, I guess. <laughs> so how about the time that they you went and got a suit because you're going to introduce Edge? Yeah. And then they, they used the tape. I stuff. know. So Edge is there. <laughs> And, you know, my famous rated R superstar announcement that is the greatest. How did that happen? <laughs> the truth is, me and Corderas, when we were driving together all the time, if somebody did something stupid, which was usually every 20 minutes or so, one of us would say, Wiley e. Coyote, super genius, you know, when somebody did something stupid. So then when Super Crazy came to WWE, I started announcing him as Super Crazy. So then when Edge had the rated R superstar, I just added a little bit more to it and more to it. And he really loved it, which you can't blame him. I mean, it's the greatest announcement ever. But, uh, you know, that's how that got started. And he always wanted me to announce him when he was there. Which, of course, now that I'm no longer with the company, of course, you would think they would bring me in to do that, but I guess they don't. But anyway, uh, so, yeah, I would bring it in. So there's one time he's in Washington and I'm there and I didn't have a suit with me. And they're like, oh, yeah, we want you to announce Edge. So I get now I got to run out. I got to go get a suit, find a suit. You know, and I only wear the, you know, the top tailored stuff. So, you know, you got to pay big bucks for this. And Omar, and, the temp maker, was uh, closed down that weekend. Stop it, Frisco. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I talked to Omar, and he's able to get me my suit. Like, like for extra material for your suit? Listen, I did not pay one cent for any of my suits that I bought. I was an employee of the company. If they wanted me to wear a suit or a tux, guess who's paying for it? Hey, Not that's Sal that's Salva Salvation, Salvation Army is a wonderful organization. <laughs> <laughs> so I go get this suit, and now it's like three quarters of the way through Raw or SmackDown or whatever we were doing, and I'm getting ready to announce that. So I go out to the bell table, and Jerkley's out there, uh, timekeeping, who is that's no Mark Yaten. Tugboat's tug son. Yeah, who is no Mark Yaten, by the way. But and, anyway, and what, and what do you say about Tugboat Son? What's the one famous thing you say about it? The shotgun. I don't know. 
Huh? Two, two, two is oh, the, oh, the Shockmaster thing. Yeah, you know, I never really remembered that because I never really watched any other wrestling than WWE. But, uh, yeah, what about it? Shockmaster, he went through the wall or something. Yeah, but you said that Shockmaster's biggest mistake was Barkley. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. Okay. <laughs> Which I just saw talk about that. He's a great guy. And so is Barkley, by the way. Uh, All in well, you're half right. Anyway. So I go out to the bell table and I'm waiting for Berkeley to cue me. And, you know, he's got to go like that to cue me. So he's like this. So now Edge's music is playing. Edge's music is playing. I'm just waiting him to point to me, you know, and I'm all ready. I got this suit. And I'm all ready. And here he comes. He's down the ramp. And I'm like, how come he's not pointing to me? How come he's not pointing to me? Because heaven forbid you go into business for yourself. You're going to the truck. It's going to freak out on you. We all know that. But anyway, I'm waiting for him to point to me. And all of a sudden I hear it on the speaker or whatever. And I'm like, oh, those pricks made me go out, get a suit, get all revved up to announce Edge. And now they just played it on the freaking speaker. So let's make fun of Tony Chimmel. Everybody's going to like that. <laughs> hey, oh, man. Man. oh, where, where, where? Yeah. Like you never deserved any of it. Would you? Yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Would you stop? Tony <laughs> Chimmel playing the victim. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Poor me. Come on. Hey, but you, you got a big run with Edge. I mean, you were his ring announcer, and then in the last scene of Vikings, uh, he stood on top of you, right? Uh, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> I just got that picture. I... <laughs> <laughs> For those that don't know, Edge was stranded in Greenland or Iceland. One of the two did a great job in the, in the, the series, by the way. Yeah. And he's he's stranded on a on a well, cutting a promo, and that's how he goes off. And you know, we just you know, is this some TV show or something? Yeah, it's something. Yeah, it's something you don't want. It's something. Yeah, <laughs> called the internet, Jimmel. Oh, <laughs> so, Jimmel, in all seriousness, all joking aside, all the matches you've watched, I was the greatest wrestler you ever saw, wasn't I? <laughs> okay. What? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, no, it's not even close. <laughs> what do you mean, not even close. I think it was. I think it was the Stooges were the greatest wrestlers. Oh, I love me some Stooges. <laughs> so, yeah. There you go, John. Hey, loves me the Stooges. <laughs> I'm like Bradshaw, who loves the Stooge. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I hate you. Or maybe Chim get Stooged on. That's yeah, I, yeah. Get, I get Stooged. I got yeah. Stooged a lot. I, I think I think JBL probably has the record in the WWF WWE. Total combined of people getting stooged on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. I, when I was working at, I can't, I, I can't recall anybody that I got more phone calls on complaints. You got to control that Texas guy. You hard. And all of a sudden, you, you hard. I mean, when John setting all these records, it was, it was. Oh, I hard this guy. Oh, I hard this guy. I hard Layfield. <laughs> And then uh, when Layfield would screw up, which was pretty, pretty damn frequent and pretty, uh, just about every international tour, I could expect one or two calls about Layfield. <laughs> and it was yeah, always the guy, the guy. A day, know, right? A <laughs> day. Tim, well, you remember that time we're sitting out in Germany somewhere, we're on a tour and I always would go out and sit by you, uh, which was a mistake, but I, you know, you got to <laughs> learn, learn as, a, as a young guy. So I go out and sit by you and you know, I'd ask, What's the time on? Well, about you know ten minutes. Okay, well I'm gonna, I'm gonna put in my agent report to Vince McMahon. Well, the, according to Tony Chimmel, the the bout went uh, the bout went about ten minutes. You know, so so. But anyway, we're sitting there one night. I think Shawn Michaels is coming out in the building, vibrating from all the applause and everything, and this damn twenty foot chain falls from the rafters. And just misses you by by a foot or so. You remember that? I mean, it it come it come. I mean, I remember looking at it and I could just see the whole link by link coming down. And I'm just praying that man hit, hit Chimmel, don't hit me. <laughs> <laughs> but it hits right yeah. beside us, you know. And we we just go on like nothing ever happened, you know. But we had some great times on those international tours over there.
Yeah, they were good. It was fun always. Uh, well, it wasn't fun going over there all the time, but uh, we always made a good time of it. Uh, the only thing was, was having to listen to all that bullcrap country music you guys played in the back of the bus all the time. Hank Williams Jr. and this guy. Everyone's going to drink some beers and Jack Daniels and sing along. <laughs> well, we did, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, you guys did. <laughs> and you Jim, did what too. was it that uh, Vince said to you that one time when he ran into you in the hall? You go, you still work here? <laughs> yeah, he always used to say that to me. He said, Jim, you still work here? So the one time I'm... He says, Chimmel, you still work here? I said, well, not really, Vince, but you're still paying me. And he's like, oh, <laughs> I'm going to have to look into that. And I said, no, no, easy, Vince, that's okay. Chimmel, well, what did you actually do? That's correct. Yeah, that's <laughs> correct. <laughs> you what said didn't, hold on, what didn't I do? Because let's face it, when I meet guys like me and Kyoto and uh, Corderas, and uh, Briscoe and Pat and uh, Joey Morella were helping to build this billion dollar company. Why schmoes like you just come in halfway through, Bradshaw? I did lighting, I did audio, I did camera, I refed a match or a couple, which Timmy White still freaking hates me for. Uh, well, Timmy hates us. Oh, yeah. so. <laughs> I'm undefeated as a wrestler. I beat Howard Finkel. Come on. Who? And one, and, and one of the most classic matches of all time is a tuxedo match. And I believe it was up in the Northeast, somewhere probably close to your hometown because you had to go over. You, you told Vance you wasn't going to do no job in your home state. Or yeah, home I don't home do that. I, I don't work and I don't do that. <laughs> hey, Chimmel, what was it you told Bob Holly when he found you, found you on the uh, massage table? <laughs> Listen, I, doing all these jobs for WWE, okay? and pretty much carrying the company on my back, it's gonna get sore every once in a while. So I go into the trainer's room and I'm like, Larry, I need the STEM unit or something. Some uh -huh. guy they put on your back with electrodes and it kind of like, you know, loosens up your back and all that. So he's got, I'm like, Larry, really? I don't know if the boys are gonna be coming in yet. He's like, no, the boys won't be showing up for an hour or so. So I get on there and I'm on there and all of a sudden I hear, what the fuck is this? And I look up and I'm like, of all the boys, Bob Holly. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. He hates me, you know? Smart man. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, listen, Bob, I'm, my back is sore from carrying the company, you know? So he just <laughs> kept on walking. I'm like, Larry, get this shit off of me. I'm getting out of here. But so your back was sore from carrying the company. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but I did. I sold merch. I did everything. Now they have no. all these people to do that stuff. Yeah, well, I Thank used you. to come in the production office every day. You did nothing. You did you did nothing. You messed with Steve Rubin. You messed with Jim, the, the security guy. You, you, you messed with Hornswoggle. You did nothing. Listen, I only had five good men. You had your hey, you it. had your own table in the production office where nobody would go over and sit because it's so damn filthy. Nobody wanted to go over and sit in that chair. They were all your you brought your lunch in there, you brought your dinner in there. I don't think you ever left that production office. It was well, like I, it was I, a was. yeah, ladies and gentlemen, the production office, you know, the, the catering's like where all mm -hmm. the talent and everybody sits and everything. But the production offices where all the produ uh, production people like Chimmel would go in and eat their meals, you know, and nobody wanted to sit close to Chimmel because number one, if you had anything in your plate, he wanted to eat, he'd just <laughs> grab your plate. So, Yeah, we had some good food delivered there, depending on where we are. Well, <laughs> Gus's fried chicken is probably the best, okay? I'm not a big fried food guy, but... Uh, Whenever we were in a plan like uh, Memphis or Detroit, I think, had a Gus's, they would get Gus's fried chicken. That was the best. And listen, I never messed with Steve Rubin only when he was awake, which was very rare. Okay? <laughs> very rare that Rubin is awake. Okay? And I got issues with what? The Battle of the Fats. You had a chance on July 4th to put a sumo suit on. We're, I think we're in Phoenix. 
<laughs> and fight against Neil Broom and defend America's honor on July 4th. And you lost on America's birthday. Cena came back and was a special guest referee. It was He's like there for one day. He's got all these movies. He got all this Hollywood stuff. He took the time out. And then you lost and embarrassed America. Well, is that the only time I've ever embarrassed America? <laughs> no. <laughs> Every time he went through Castle, you do We had, we we had commentary. America we had commentary. <laughs> All the boys were out there, and you and you and let them call, call them Limey, sat out there in your sumo outfits. And, <laughs> and fought each other <laughs> two out of three falls. On America's I think birthday. you actually outdrew your matches for that. <laughs> to, to, Tony set up set up that that, that contest for us because that, that that's really a funny funny uh, time in our business there with you with well, you and Neil. Neil, they tell everybody first who Neil is because Neil Neil's one of those. You know, we have so many of them at, at, at WWE, and you're not one of them, but we have so many talented people backstage. <laughs> and Neil is one of the most. Are you going to say I'm not one of them? <laughs> no, you're not one of them. Neil, Neil is a very talented guy. And everybody loves Neil. Are you kidding me? Anyway, so yeah, Neil, oh, Neil's Neil so Broom, or as we call him, Limey. We all love him. him. But, uh, I like how you, wait a minute. Now, Neil's so much beloved by the group. Before his father passed away, everybody went over to England. We had beers with his father, and everybody paid yeah. homage to Neil and to, to his father. That was before uh, he beat America, which you were the proxy, <laughs> unfortunately. Well, we were doing a show. We were, this is before the actual sumo fight or so, whatever fight. But we were in Phoenix, the same town. And uh, I remember because I was working – in the production office and there had to be happened to have be a tv there and the mets were in the world series against kansas city so i'm i'm watching the game and he's like messing around with me messing around with it. i'm like why me stop it i'm trying to work i'm trying to do stuff you know and i'm trying to watch the game you know so he keeps messing around messing around with me and i just get up and we just kind of like push around a little bit and he, he must have tripped or fallen. Oh, no, wait. I actually physically pushed the crap out of him. And he kind of bumped his head a little bit. And he's like, you know, then, of course, one thing led to another. And it turned into a concussion and this and that. So I was bragging for years how I beat the crap out of him. And uh, how I beat the crap out of him. And uh, he's like, well, you want to go fight? Let's have a real fight and this and that. I'm like, that was a real fight. I won. I'm not fighting anymore. I'm at the top of the mountain. So then, I don't know, somebody thought of this whole sumo thing and doing this and all that and having it on July 4th because we had to work July 4th. Of course, and that machine never takes a day off. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> you, they you, never, you never had a day on. <laughs> yeah. That's what I said. That machine never took a day off. I did, though. <laughs> So then, yeah, then they set up the whole thing and we did it for fun and for charity or whatever. And you know, it was a good time. Wait a minute. Everyone was entertained there. And you, in a reenactment of the Revolutionary War, you represented America and lost. That, that, that's not really a reenactment. That's like changing history. Well, it's what I, I make history is what I do. <laughs> I, I thought you did. <laughs> By the, way, were, by the way, I wish you were history, Bradshaw. But anyway, <laughs> I don't know much about the Revolutionary War. I wasn't there like you were. So I just did my part. I don't know. We won. We lost. Whatever. I tried my best. And I put the limey over this time. So he won the fake fight. I won the real fight. That's <laughs> hey, what I mean. Chimel, it seems like you were always the guy that everybody challenged that wanted to win. You know, and uh, and so they wouldn't challenge a Layfield or a Ron Simmons or anybody like that. They always challenge the Chimmel. Uh, and uh, but you're you're known you're known for one of the two guys that actually closed down a billion dollar TV production one day and a great race at Penn State and uh, with yeah. the Jonathan Coachman. Yeah. And you pulled probably the upset of the century that day and everybody everybody thought the race was fixed everybody thought there's no way 
Vince, Kevin Dunn, everybody, they I've shut down the WWE <laughs> to go out on this track at uh, uh, Penn State and watch you, what was a mile race, four laps around the track. Yeah. And uh, yep. somehow you come out victorious in this, and, uh, and it was the celebration that Penn State had never seen. You thought they'd beat Texas in the Rose Bowl or something, you know? So, but uh, kind of just to take us through how that race was set up and, and how in the hell did you beat a, a world class athlete like Jonathan Coachman? <laughs> world class athlete, coach. <laughs> I'm glad you said that. Okay. <laughs> Anywho, so we always used to, I think I was announcing SmackDown at the time. So I didn't have to announce it raw. And I wasn't working in the production office, but I was at raw. So we would always sit in the pre tapes room and it'd be me, coach, and Cole. This was before he was doing it all as announcing Gaga or whatever. But we would always sit in pre tapes, watch the show, and just shoot the shit and stuff like that. And I was sitting there and I'm telling coach, I'm like, hey, you know, I'm going to start to, you know, lose some weight and get into shape. And I started running, you know, on the treadmill. And coach is like, well, how fast are you running? And I'm like, I don't know. I think I do like a mile in like 10 minutes or something like that. He's like 10 minutes. That sucks. You know? And I'm like, Oh, I suppose you could run faster. Right. So we start getting in this argument about it and stuff like that. And then I think it was Cole or somebody brings up, why don't you guys have a race? You know? And so, well, where we eat coaches, like I'll, I'll beat you by a minute, you know, in a mile race. And, and, uh, Cole's like, well, hey, we're going to be in Penn State in like two or three months. They got the track right there, right outside the the arena, the back of the arena. Why don't you guys have a race? So I'm like, okay, I think we bet like a hundred bucks or something like that. Oh, and also the loser had to do a hundred push-ups whenever the other person said. <laughs> you could have them do five or ten or one at a time or anything. So. If I lost, I would have to do a push-up and say, I'm a fat piece of shit. And uh, if if I won, Coach, when he had to do his push-ups, he would have to say, I am Tony Chimmel's bitch. Okay? So he had to beat me by he had to beat me by a minute. So he now spot- it's started- what? He spotted you, uh, what, a minute. Uh, right. We could either, even, right? right. We could either start at the same time or I would get a minute head start. And then he would then he would run after a minute. So we started this. Uh, we we started this, and it just started getting through the company through the weeks. Like oh, this big race and this big race and all that. They had a press conference and all that. And pre tapes one day, and there was like a bunch of people there asking us questions and and this and that. Uh, I, I go back because it wasn't a minute. It was 30 seconds. He's like, I'll beat you by 30 seconds. So in this press conference, he's like, 30 seconds is going to be easy. I could beat him by a minute. And then The Rock called him out. And The Rock said, well, if you can beat him by a minute, why don't you up it to a minute? And he called him out on it. And Coach is like, okay, it's a minute. So now I'm like, oh, this is great. I run. I got a, uh, I have a, uh, a minute head start or whatever. So – come to do the race it's like the whole company like you said briscoe just stopped and it's like the camera guys were out there they were filming it and all this and they had a big crowd there bruce was like the stopwatch guy so he would clock us every time and there was commentary there was commentary i think kevin kelly was doing it the rock was doing it and uh cole i think was doing it too i'm not sure but when we got to the track it was like the girls track team was there to practice and they were like, hey, we got this one quick race. It's only going to take, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. Do you mind? And the girls were like, yeah, go ahead. Use the track. So they let us use it. So I had my choice. Either, you know, start a minute ahead or we both start at the same time. I chose to start at the same time and just try to stay with them. So we go around. the, the We start. The race starts. We go around the first time. And... uh you know, he's ahead of me a little bit, you know, and now we go around the second time and he's still ahead of me by a little bit. And I'm like, geez, he's going to have to start opening it up soon. You know, I'm feeling pretty good Go around a third time and he's still not opening it up. And he's like, you know, just, I don't know, maybe 50 feet, a hundred feet ahead of me. Now we're going around the fourth time. 
and he's still not opening it up and he's just a little bit ahead of me. And now we're coming down the stretch and I'm like, Oh shit. I'm like, I feel pretty good. I start like really running fast and I almost caught up to him. I ran my mile in three or I'm sorry. I ran my mile in six minutes and 36 seconds. He ran his in six minutes and 35 seconds. So <laughs> he, he opened, after the race, I, Shane, who was my personal trainer, which nobody ever knew about, I also got a free pair of sneakers out of the deal. I don't know how they were. They just arrived in the production office one day. I got a new pair of sneakers, running shoes, which was nice. But uh, I <laughs> heard there did, did, you ever find, did, did you ever find out who the sneakers were from? Where were they? From no, from? no idea who they were from. No I idea. Got, I think it was Dwayne Johnson, probably. <laughs> A lot of people think it was Shane, which may could have been. I don't know that to be true. But, uh, yeah, uh, I did have a secret gift from uh, somebody that got me new sneakers for the race, which was nice. After the race, I got one of those victory laps in a golf cart. The only people really <laughs> rooting for me, I think, was Kyoto, Mark Yaten, uh, and Shane. That was about it. Everybody else in the company was all over coach, you know. So wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jerry, you were there. Yeah. How many people were for Chimmel? <laughs> <laughs> Zero. <laughs> I know Kyoto was for me, and oh, I know dear. Shane was for me. I know actually, that. Actually, Chimmel, actually, Chimmel and Ferris, we kept thinking Chimmel has never won anything in his life. I mean, like his whole life, and he never will again. If he can beat coach. This is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To, to me, it was like one of those great little league games, you know, where this team, where they break out, you know, they're heavily favored. You look over, you look over to, uh, at, the, at the visitor sideline, and there are all these hawking, you know, six, seven, eight, ten-year-olds, you know. You look over on the home team, Chimel's team, and there's all these little 98-pound weaklings and everything. So, you know, you kind of, you kind of start rooting for the underdog to, as the race was building. And we knew you had that minute as the race was building, as you go one lap and two lap, like you described the, the distance wasn't a minute, you know? And, uh, but I think at one time he got a pretty good lead on you. You kicked it in and you closed that lead up by the time you guys started on that fourth, fourth lap. I mean, the, the intensity of the, of the crowd, you built the crowd like a championship match. And all of a sudden, <laughs> I all of a the sudden, crowd. That's what I did. All, all, all of a sudden, uh, the crowd started realizing the underdog's going to win. All these little, little leaguers, you know, 90 pounds are going to beat all these 150 pound six year olds. And, and, and all of a sudden, here come, and you probably weighed 150 pounds at six years old, too. All of a sudden, <laughs> here, here we go on that last, last 220 yards, and Chim will stand close to them, ladies and gentlemen. And the crowd starts buzzing. We're going to see the upset of the century here. We're going to see this. And all of a sudden, they come across. And sure enough, we, we were witness, John, to, to we the upset of, of the WWE uh, uh, century. Yo. So what a, what, a, what a day it was. But you actually closed down TV production for this thing. I, I, I only wish that I started running faster earlier. <laughs> Or no, the, you don't. Was, <laughs> or the race was ten feet longer because I would have beaten him. You'd have beaten him. <laughs> up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Co coach barely made it. Coach was tightening yeah. up. His hamstrings were hurting. His back was hurting. Coach didn't train. Coach just thought he could beat you easily. He didn't. Yeah, train. I was training. I was training, and I, I probably I lost probably about thirty or forty pounds before I before I had that race. But what was great was now he had owed me a hundred push-ups. You know, anytime, and. uh you got so, him at his wedding, didn't you? Uh, no, that was one of the ones that I, I had two push-ups left. And I said I was going to wait to do one on when he was on the altar for his wedding day. And the other one was going to be when he was in the delivery room and his wife was going to give birth to her first kid. That's when I was going to make him do a push-up, the, the last two. But I said, you know what, Coach, you've been great through all this. I'm eliminating the last two. But let me tell you about a few that we had to do. So right after the race... Of course, he had to do one at the finish line and say, my name is Tony Chim or I am Tony Chimmel's bitch or whatever. So the next day after State College, we're in Pittsburgh doing a TV. Now, Vince wasn't outside at the race, but we're all in the production office. 
And Vince is like, well, before we start the meeting, Jim, I heard you won the big race, you know? And I'm like, yeah, I did. Thanks, Vince. And uh, he says, would you mind if you made coach do a push up on the table here right in front of me? I'm like, absolutely not. I said, coach, get up there and give me a push up. So he has to get up on the table right in front of Vince, do a push up and say, I am Tony Chimmel's bitch. <laughs> I was at right. a charity event one time with Coach, and they yeah. put you on his cell phone and Coach in front of everybody. Now, to his credit, he did it. He was yeah. good about he it. was always good about it. Yeah, he did. To his Coach's credit, he owned up to every single bit of it. And he, he got on the microphone. He goes, folks, I've got to announce I'm Tony Chimmel's bitch. And he got down <laughs> and did a push-up. <laughs> the boys he did. crazy. This is weird because I came home one day and I walk in the door and my my phone goes off and it's a 203 number and I'm like, hello. And she and the, the lady's like, Tony, I'm like, yeah, he said, this is Sue Aitchison from the office. I'm like, oh, hey, how you doing? She's like, I'm down here with Hunter and some other WWE people. We're in front of the Pentagon and Hunter wants to know if you can make coach do a push up in front of all the military people at the Pentagon. And I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't, I don't know who made who names a building after a uh, after after a square or a pentagon or whatever. But anyway, so I'm like, sure. She's like, okay, just be by your phone. I'm gonna call you back in like ten minutes. So she calls me back. I get on. I'm like, coach, give me a push up. <laughs> so I had to do it right there in the pentagon. I was at the pentagon with Hunter and Sue Edgerson when you did it. it yeah, was, it was General Odierne. It was all the top oh. brass. Everybody. And coach, you can wow. see his face just shrink. Like a everyone wants to talk to you. He goes, not here. Come not on, here. not here. Not here. <laughs> and he gave the phone. And coach says, folks, I've got to announce I'm Tony Chimmel's bitch. And he got to a push. Back. Yeah, he was very good at it, you know. I called him one time. I just called him and said, hey, Coach, what are you doing? He's like, Oh, I'm just in a limo here with JR and we're going to go announce an XFL game or something, you know? And I said, well, why don't you have the limo driver stop the car, get on the side of the road and give me a push up. And I huh. said, make sure you keep the phone. But he's like, Chimmel, it's snowing outside. I'm like, I don't care. Give me a push up. <laughs> he had to stop the limo go on the side of the road, do a push up. <laughs> it's the greatest thing ever. ever. Yeah, there was another one, too. This was, we were all in some place in, like, Fargo, North Dakota, or something like that, did a TV. And the next morning, you know, we're on one of these little small planes. It only holds about 50 or 70 people. And everyone's flying to Minneapolis so they can then get their connection and go home. And it's all WWE people on the, uh, on the plane. And I talked to the stewardess. Am I allowed to say stewardess? Is that okay? No. No, well, it was a chick flight attendant. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, that, that's well, a lot less offensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. that's really well done, Chimel. Thanks. So I, 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 <laughs> we were sorry. It's I, our I show. To, I talked to the stewardess. Gary, and this, I told you this is a bad idea. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so I, I talked to the stewardess and I say, hey, do you mind if I make a little announcement on the phone? I just want to do this or something. So it's all WWE people. I get on the little thing and I'm like, oh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for flying Northwest Airlines. And, you know, we should be taking off soon. Oh, and by the way, coach, can you get up and give me a push up? So he has to get up on the plane, get in the aisle way, do a push up and say, I am Tony Chimmel's big bitch. <laughs> Everyone on the plane popped. <laughs> the greatest bet ever. You know, they're doing all this stuff with Jake Paul and, you know, uh, Tommy Fury and all the tattoos. This was the greatest bet ever. This oh. one with Chimmel and Coach. Okay. First of all, you're going to – first of all, we're not here to put me over, okay? I don't know why we're even doing this, but I'll take it. I don't either. I don't either. <laughs> tell you the truth. I'm sorry. I don't know how to handle it, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I will edit all that out. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure this will be the part that's totally out. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I know there will be the What do you mean edit? We're not live? I only Any, do live anything stuff. Anything that makes Come you on. look good, we're going to edit. There's no <laughs> doubt about it. John, what was the story you were telling me earlier about when he deserted uh, Chimmel or deserted Kyoto and Shane O'Mac? Oh, my and, goodness. Yeah. He left. 
a McMahon. Yeah. What what did he go get? A Philly cheesesteak or something like that? Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> he left your buddy. Yeah, let me tell you something. Kyoto was on here and he did a great job, by the way, because he, he's he's excellent. We're getting yeah. canceled after this and even making it through the show. And he said, Oh, Jimmel's the best. You yeah. with your older, wiser, and uh, fatter shirt, <laughs> better shirt, better shirt. <laughs> Set, left him and Shane McMahon because he had a chance to, to have a few little hors d'oeuvres yeah. with Willie Nelson. Okay. So <laughs> we do we do a show in God's country in Philly, right? After the show, I we thought break Philly from, was New Jersey. Yeah. I thought yeah, that's Philly, New Jersey, Jersey, South Jersey, all that. Yeah. South Jersey. Philly, Jersey. Come on. South Jersey, of course. North Jersey's too much of that New York gaga. But anyway, so we did the show in Philly and break down the ring. And to Shane's credit, Shane always kicked ass breaking the ring down. He was great to work with, always worked hard, always did what we said and all that. And wait a uh, minute, take, take, wait take a minute. Him back. Take him did back what you said? Well, yeah, we were in charge of the ring, you know. Yeah, I'll take take him back a little bit. When Shane O'Mac first started, he that's how he started. He started on a road crew with you guys, right? That's yeah, the reason. That's the reason yeah, Shane when, he was, on... when he was in college or summer summer break from school or whatever, he would come and work with us, and and he would come on the ring and he would learn, you know, to his credit from the bottom up, and you know, he paid his dues and he would drive in the ring truck and. At that time, we only had a two-seater ring truck, and he would have to sit, like, on the hump in the middle of the ring truck. And there's me and Kyoto smoking cigarettes. He hated cigarettes. And we both smoked then. And it's, like, the middle of wintertime one time. He's like, roll those fucking windows down. I hate that smoking. You know, as bad as Vince with cigarettes. But we would be, like, smoking like this, driving down the highway, you know. <laughs> And he hated it, but he always busted his ass at work and was a great help and, and worked hard and played the music and took jackets. That's what I'm saying. We did it all. Audio, video, camera, announcing, wrestling, took jackets, all that stuff. We used to wear a suit when we took jackets. Now you got Nick Dahl or somebody uh, just taking jackets, you know, in a T-shirt and shorts or something. It's ridiculous. Now, Nick, Nick's a nice guy, by the way. I love why, 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 why do you got to knock Nick? I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. Why you hate Look, I love Nick, Nick Dahl. He's great, and he's a work, a hard worker, I know. I don't want to offend Nick Dahl. I love Nick Dahl. But I'm just okay. saying. When did Nick Dahl? <laughs> okay. Uh, I used to do the camera work, not like these camera donnas that they got now. Like and, uh, Mar Mar Marty, Mar Marty Miller's one of the most talented camera guys. Now you're knocking Marty Miller. And Marty's Billy great. Thomas I love and, uh, Marty Miller. I know. And Billy, Billy you Thomas. Him a camera donna? Yeah. yeah. A camera yeah. donna. Marty Miller is a camera donna. No, Marty Miller's a director, but he was part of the camera donnas when he was a camera guy. <laughs> Yeah, those guys are spoiled worse than anything. But they work hard, too. But I'm just saying, I did all that stuff. And I was never treated. So Shane O'Mac, when, when you ran out on Shane O'Mac. When you left okay. it. Okay, so. Now, we now, 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 now that you buried all the production people that you worked <laughs> so many years backstage with, and you just threw them all under the bus, you know, Everyone saying how much you uh, Well, they can join me, because I've been down here for under the bus for about 30 years. <laughs> So anyway, we break the ring down. Shane, to his credit, like always, kicked ass. We got it out of there early. And the Nasty Boys, who happen to be from Allentown, Pennsylvania, all their all their family and friends rented a bus, and were you know went to the show. And after the show, they were at this bus and they were just drinking and partying and had homemade wine and all that. So after we tear down, Kyoto and Shane are like, "Hey, uh, you know." We're going to go over, hang out with the Nasty Boys for a little bit, have some homemade wine. We'll be back in a little bit. And I'm like, okay, well, listen, we got to drive up. To, we got a show tomorrow in Glens Falls, New York. It's the winter time. We don't know what the weather's going to be like in upstate New York. I'll give you a few minutes, and then, then we'll go. So I'm sitting there. I'm waiting. I don't know, 20 minutes, half hour, whatever. Beat the horn. Let's go. I see him pop out of the bus. They're like, yeah, we'll be out there in a minute or two. So now I'm waiting another 15, 20 minutes. I'm like, 
Let's go. Beat the horn. I don't hear from him. I don't see him. So I'm like, hmm, let me just slowly start pulling the, the truck out. So I'm slowly pulling the truck out of the parking lot. And I'm figuring, oh, well, they'll start coming. You know, they'll come. They'll start coming. And I'm slowly going. I'm slowly going. And next thing I know, I'm out the parking lot. And I'm like, well, they're out the parking lot. I'm going. You know, <laughs> they never showed up. So I started cruising and went up there. And you left them. Yeah. Well, yeah, kind of, if you want to get technical about it. Well, that's one, of, that's, that's, that, yeah, that, that's one of the rules of the road, John. You never leave who you came with, right? Ever. Uh, ever. I mean, uh, wow. You brought so the story And was, Shane O'Mac, one of them. So Kyoto was on here and told the story. Now, he did a wonderful job because, you know, when, when he was on here, we still had a show. You're on here. We'll, yeah. we'll be canceled. <laughs> and told us that, that Willie Nelson was around. There was a little party going on. And Willie he, Nelson? Yeah, the singer. You mean the guy that cheats on his taxes? <laughs> the Texan. Would you not oh, have been anybody else? <laughs> what? No, he didn't. He didn't cheat on his taxes. He's a Texan. He's honest. <laughs> and so you left your you left a big man and Kyoto and drove off without him. Yeah. <laughs> Do you yep. not feel bad about that? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. So what they so, <laughs> so what they say to you the next day? No. So here's the deal. So I start driving, and uh, I start driving, and there was a place right in uh, Poughkeepsie where, where we would always stay. It was right off the highway, some little super eight or something like that. So I drive the ring truck there. It's about maybe an hour or so from Glens Falls. And I, I get the truck up there. Next thing I know, I hear this bang on my hotel room door. Like I never heard a bang before. And I'm like, oh boy, I guess they found me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm not getting up to answer that door at four o'clock in the morning. So, uh, because, you know, they found me because the ring truck had WWF written all over it at that time. <laughs> Yeah, big old blue truck. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, the next morning we get up and we're having breakfast and we're talking and we're arguing. I'm like, listen, I got to go. I beat the horn for you guys. I waited like a half hour, 45 minutes. You guys never came. I said, the ring's got to get to Glens Falls, New York. If it never gets there, there's not going to be a show tomorrow. And then we ain't going to have jobs, you know? And that was my side of the argument. And their side of the argument was, you should have never left us. You know, you should have. Back then, we didn't have cell phones either. So, you know, they couldn't get in contact with me. But turns out, the nasty boys gave Kyoto a ride back to his house. And you did, for anyone out there, you do not want the nasty boys anywhere near your house or your no. personal property no. or anything. You know, but Kyoto had a fish tank in his room. And the fish, tank, the fish tank had piranhas in it. And the nasty boys are sticking, he killed it with Tommy. They were sticking their hands in the fish tank, trying to catch the piranhas and stuff like that. And Kyoto's just like, thanks for the ride, guys. You got to go. You know, my mom and dad are here and stuff like that. He was just trying to get them the hell out of the house. So, Isn't that illegal to have piranhas? Or the nasty boys at your house? Which one? <laughs> uh, both, both. But uh, yeah, it's you're illegal right, to have piranhas. Yes, yes, it is. Yes. Way to stooge, Kyoto. <laughs> it, it's 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 New Jersey. Yeah, I mean anything goes in Jersey. I mean, Correct. So, <laughs> and they, they had they had Chimel there uh, forever. So <laughs> remember our reunion with Cena on his bus when he when he took your cell phone. Yeah, and put it in a place where he shouldn't have put it. I still have that one. Where, where? <laughs> so Jerry, Jerry, Cena's made it big now. You know he's, you know he's been all these movies. He's, he's, you know, he's all these voiceovers, everything, and he comes back. And you know, Cena's one of the most down to earth guys in the world. Uh, you know, and he obviously he feels sorry for Chimmel. So you know, <laughs> so, so Cena says, "Hey, for a reunion, let's go on our bus." and drive to the next town with us and we'll have a little moonshine or something. And so he goes, the only rule is 
you can't be on your cell phone. Now you've got this Hollywood star, this WWE wrestler who's made it big, doing us this big favor, taking us on this private bus, taking us to the next town, furnishing all the drinks, the food, everything. His only rule was don't be on your cell phone. His only rule. And Chimmel is over there like a 14-year-old kid on his cell phone. <laughs> Finally, Cena grabs it and throws it. And as he throws it, I'm leaning forward and it hits me in the eye and busts my eye open. <laughs> yeah. And you were bleeding, too. <laughs> I, was, I was bleeding all over the place. Well, the first thing he did with the phone was. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I think Quite I had to Clorox that thing around 20 times before I could use it again. <laughs> I'm shocked you didn't have a frame. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a good time. That was a good time. And you once did a Chimel Rooney. Did I really? I heard you did. Jim you Corderas. tried. You tried. Yeah, yeah you tried I probably it. tried it. Yeah. <laughs> Jim Corderas. You know I, I, I sent Jimmy a text this morning. He really dislikes you, as, as does all of Canada. <laughs> and uh, I said, hey, send me some Chimmel stories. We're adding on here. Because what we're trying to do, Chimmel, is, is we're, I hate to admit this publicly, and I apologize to you, Mr. Briscoe. Uh, well, I'm, I'm on your side, John, on that, sir. Thank you. You've got this thing called Cameo, which you call Chimio. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And we're trying to push your chimio. We're trying to get you to go to all these autograph sessions and let everybody know that you're entertaining and let them hate you as much as we hate you. Yeah. Impossible, so, but I'm sure they'll try. Like, like you said, our backs are tired of carrying you around. So we want to share the load with the general public out there. So please book Tony Chimel. His cameos are chimios are, are second to none. And what we're hoping is book Tony Chimmel on Cameo. And we're hoping that Chimmel, you get so many cameos, you like get so excited, you have like a heart attack or something. And that would be a success. Well, I don't know about that, but you know, you've actually given me new life, Brad Shaw. You know? <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> this is like a new beginning. I never thought there'd be life after WWE, but thanks to you. You know, and all this Gaga like Chimio's and uh, you know autograph signings. There might be life after that. And I mean, who wouldn't want my autograph? Seriously. Yeah, sir. Are you open for autographs? I mean, where? How can they reach you? Yeah, I know you have. Do you have? No. You know what social media is nowadays? It's a no, new thing. No, I got to uh, get back on Twitter or whatever that thing is. is I yeah, talk, it's I not talk Twitter. Yeah. Huh? It's yeah. not Twitter. It's Twitter. Twitter big. Twitter or big. All right. Uh, well, I I get on I get on that thing. I don't know if I'm getting on the Instagram thing or Ashbook or anything like that. But you know, uh, I'm, our, I'm, our good friend Pat Patterson used to say, "Hey, Briscoe, you on face face face?" I said, "No, I'm not on that one. I missed that one, Pat. What is that?" I'm like oh. Ashbook, and then didn't they change the name of this Ashbook? What is it called now, or something? It's I don't know. Meta. They've changed Meta. the corporate name. It's called Meta. What is it? Facebook it affect it, it, somebody? It won't, it won't affect you, Tony. No, Jim. <laughs> it doesn't affect you at all. You, you and your cousins that follow you. I mean, it's not going to affect you. I, I cannot believe you figured out how to get on Zoom. I can't. Well, either. you before know what? I I actually, actually, I had to because when, before I got furloughed and before I got uh, let go, we were still having like these Zoom meetings with uh, the, uh, all of this in the production office. So we would just touch base and I had to get on it. And, you know, my daughter walked me through how to get on it and all that. So I, I, I don't know. Now you just click something and I'm on it. I still don't know if I'm doing it right, but whatever. How, how many know? times did Cena AAU in your tuxedo? Oh, God, I don't, I don't know, but... <laughs> The later on it got, the more it hurt. I know that. He did play in England. Did, did you ever split your pants out on any of those AAs? No, thank God. Well, I, yeah, yeah it, it's amazing, too, because as broad as your, your, your oh, AA yeah, not is. Oh, yeah, how much is down there. I mean, seriously, you know. <laughs> he got more ass than a donkey farm. Oh, boy. <laughs> 
<laughs> Tony, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule down and down at beautiful Fort Myers, Florida. We do, I recommend it. I we do, Jerry. You know, yes, Jerry, yes. I really we appreciate do. this. <laughs> you know, you know, John, I'm trying to make some chicken salad here. With <laughs> 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 but thank you for your time. Bro. I appreciate it. And hopefully I'll get on Twitter soon. And anyone that wants to do a cameo, look me up or a chimio. I'll be more than happy to do it. Uh, get in now while the price is low, because the price is only going to go up. But anywho, it's been fun. I enjoyed <laughs> it. I might have to do one of these again. <laughs> we hope not. Uh, not on this show. <laughs> yeah, not. not on this one. <laughs> Maybe well, there's somebody you know, else. I'm gonna come down to Florida, and I'm gonna see you and and Mr. Briscoe and Carol Baskin. We can all get together and talk about the Tiger King. There you go. <laughs> or Michael right. Hayes or his fanny packer. <laughs> Are you leaving Shane McMahon? Yeah, whatever. Well, <laughs> all right. Well, this is our last podcast, so uh, thanks everybody for watching <laughs> us. And, and so, sorry about save the, the best for last. Sorry about the previous hour and a half. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.